Vanessa. Uh, I don't. Didn't How's talk to you today. <laughs> Not, hardly at all. It's been it's been a minute. It's it's so weird recording episodes out of order. We yeah. just recorded something that we're probably going to publish what three four weeks from now. Mm-hmm. And it was it was a doozy. It was a doozy. It was a good one, but it was a doozy. I I, I hope so. To be continued on that. Mm-hmm. Today, we have on uncertain things, which you're. Uh, thank you for joining. Welcome to Uncertain Things, an uncertain podcast. With uncertain hosts. And speaking of uncertainty, I have a Hitler-related question that I, I want to bring up in this intro, but <laughs> I'll do it after we introduce our guest, because today we have Yuval Levine. He's a conservative scholar, intellectual, policy wonk, former White House staffer. He founded the magazine National Affairs. He writes for National Review. He wrote numerous books, including most recently A Time to Build, which we'll talk about. And he's, and I hope I'm getting this right, the Director of Cultural, Social, and Constitutional Studies at AEI. But what affected me is he managed to take me along with him and to even change my mind on several issues about which I was predisposed to disagree with him. So that's just always mind-blowing to me when people take their role in the public sphere seriously and are actively trying to bring people over. This is all the more reason why it was important for me to bring him on this podcast, and I'm so glad we had the opportunity to talk and even argue a little bit. So we talked about his theory on the decline of institutions and why he sees it as key to understanding the current deterioration of our culture and polity more broadly. We talked about what institutions mean, what it means to be on the left or the right, or to be a conservative or a liberal. I also piloted my, my little hobby model, trying to re- reinterpret the axes of political thought in, in the US right now. And I, I, it, it's, a, it's a thought that uh, occurred to me when we were preparing for the interview and uh, was reading uh, Yuval's work. And I wanted to, to test it with him. And you, you listeners are welcome to be the judge of whether I made a persuasive case or not. And of course, we talked about Edmund Burke and Thomas Paine because uh, obviously we did. Mm-hmm. I got to bring up, I got to shoot a... Uh, a question from my kind of more urbanism background and I got to ask him about kind of theories of social infrastructure and how that intersect with some of the things that he's talking about about the the fall of institutions and social cohesions he took that that ball and ran with it oh yeah and just as a reminder we kind of sort of see this as a second part of a mini series that we started last week with Caitlin Flanagan the previous episode had an emergent theme of repressive patterns, especially in the field of sexuality, but not just when the individual interfaces with society and the current political context of it. And I think it's interesting to move to Yuval, who expands and complicates the picture by emphasizing just how vital some of those institutional stopgaps on individual desire, ambition can be, and how bad things can get when you lose those stopgaps. So we're going to get to all of that, or you can jump ahead to your uh, a topic of interest based on our time codes below. But before, make sure you subscribe to uncertain.substack.com and or wherever you get your podcasts. If you want to support what we're doing, please give us a five-star review rating on Apple Podcasts because that makes a huge difference and is just a nice thing. And we'll appreciate it. Also, you can follow us on Uncertain Pod on Twitter and Instagram and share your thoughts with us because we'd love to, to talk. And oh, but there, there was one thing I wanted to bring up with you okay. at the outset and forgot, and I think it is an important question. Okay, but okay. Just something that really bothered me this week and I wanted to share with you. Oh, okay. When you think about time travel, <laughs> what's, uh-huh. the, what's the first thing that you think you should do? <laughs> when, I, when I think about time travel, what's the... When the idea of time travel comes up in a conversation, uh-huh. what's the first thing you think you should do you're expected to say what where would which era would you time travel to oh come on vanessa you know this if you are oh. in like you have you have the ability to travel to the past i'll be more specific okay what historical event are you supposed oh, to be you're supposed to ask about if you're going to kill hitler or not right exactly you're supposed to ask if you're going to kill how quickly you're going to kill hitler if you could travel right, exactly. back in time thank you yeah but it's even more specific than that right because it's about whether you're going to kill baby hitler oh right 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 okay great so that thought 
was like one of those shower thoughts that stayed with me for a whole day and I couldn't shake. Why is that a thing? Supposed to be presented this as this high minded dilemma. Hmm. Will you will you have the moral fortitude to do what it takes and kill a baby mm-hmm. despite their like you know in this minority report situation when the the kid is not yet responsible for his future the crimes of his future self but you uh-huh. know the consequences so you have to get baby blood on your hands like why why do you need to kill him can't you just kidnap the baby right. done you've probably changed history sufficiently right that, I mean if you haven't fucked it up with you know some butterfly effect bullshit. Probably you're, you've averted the Holocaust, you know. The only answer that I could come up with, and I don't know if you have your own explanation, is that we've imbued the character of Hitler with this supernatural force mm-hmm. of evil, of preternatural it's a, evil. It's a that, flip side of great man. Thing, exactly. Yeah. He, and, which means that you won't be able to really eradicate the potential of the holocaust unless you really kill him as a baby and he <laughs> let him live in any other circumstances and he will still find his way like like ganon in the legend of zelda you'll always find a way back to the tries force and kidnapping zelda and it's so stupid because the history itself is if anything just a series of the failure of everyone else around hitler to stop him It's not about Hitler's brilliance. I mean, right. he was good at manipulating people. He, he was good at agitation and he understood propaganda. But for the most part, it is the constant punishable pattern of people around him underestimating him. Right. Till the very last right. second of his ascent, when the government of the Weimar Republic on its deathbed, in its final breath, said, let him be chancellor. Don't worry. We got this under control. Which meant, it'll be fine. It will be fine. He, he is just a grunt. We got him under our thumb. Hmm. That's the basic story of Hitler rolling through history. People just underestimated him. And yet we give him this aura of unearthly evil bubbling from the netherworld. As opposed to just a narcissistic, sexually challenged sociopath with homicidal tendencies that nobody smacked down when they had their chance. We do the same thing with just Nazis in general. It's just like we love to hate them, and so it's like we just like to be like they are the ultimate villains. Yes, you know, this is what happens when you have uh, a cult, potentially people that would have been good actors put into a situation where they then become bad actors. And therein exactly is my point and how yeah. I slightly am tying this to our conversation. Oh, okay, yeah, oh, do tell because I was very, losing the thread in here. a very tortured way, in a very tortured way that. <laughs> The real story of the Nazis is exactly that. It's not the story of pure evil emanating from the earth and possessing the corporeal form of Hitler. It's the story of people failing and then institutions bending yeah. to those failures, to those glitches of moral failure. Hmm. Once yeah. the institutions bent, right. the, everything else came into place. Because once you had an entire state apparatus working in the service of one person's megalomania it, it was so easy to churn everyone else and reshape right. them in the right, image right. of this new corrupt regime okay and with that nice you didn't expect it to go the full tortured <laughs> circle did you <laughs> with that you all have been hey you all thank you for joining us thanks very much for having me i think vanessa and i are both from the at least brought up on the uh I'd say liberal persuasion. And um, I, I, I think... It's like, this is our confession. <laughs> It's like, this is how you're starting. <laughs> and I, I think y- you are, like, y- your writing, your, your commentary has really made me reevaluate some of my, my assumptions about the dynamics between, between what it means to be on the right, on the left, conservative, liberal. And I want to get into those bigger uh, definitional issues a little later. But let's start just for, for the sake of anyone who's listening who, who, who doesn't know who you are. What's your uh, elevator bio? Well, I'm a, I'm a political scientist working at the intersection of what I would say is public policy and political theory. Um, on the one hand, uh, I have a, an academic background, I have a PhD from the University of Chicago, and um, my, my work on that front has basically been in political theory. But I've also worked in public policy now for more than 20 years. 
Uh, I was a congressional staffer for a member of the House and for the Bu House Budget Committee and then for the Speaker of the House. Uh, I worked uh, in HHS in the Bush administration and then worked at the White House um, as a domestic policy staffer under George W. Bush. And then I've been in the think tank world um, since uh, the end of the Bush administration and uh, am now a scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Um, I, I run a division of AI that's focused on what we call social, cultural, and constitutional studies, basically the, the health of American institutions. Um, and I run a policy journal called National Affairs, which is a quarterly that I started in 2009. We're going to get into the core arguments in your book, A Time to Build, in a second. But I want to ask you just broadly, what are the political questions that occupy you right now? Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a conservative in a time when it's challenging to be a conservative. And so the questions that trouble me, on the one hand, have to do with the condition and the future of the right, that is what becomes now of the people in our politics who are committed to preserving what is best about our political order and addressing its problems by building on its strengths. That's how I think of what conservatives do. People who begin from what's good about what we have and then try to deal with what's bad. Um, you know, the American right in this moment isn't really focused on being conservative in that way, but is much more inclined to begin from a kind of outrage or aggrievement um, and a a assault what it perceives as the establishments of our society and the elites of our society. And I think an, an anti-institutional right can be quite dangerous and that there are a lot of reasons to remind the right of the need for our institutions, of what it is that they do for us and what it would mean to restore them and recover them. That's one piece of what I do. The other is a more traditional set of public policy issues that I've been concerned about and working in for two decades and more. Uh, the range of domestic issues, healthcare, education, welfare, these are areas where I still do a lot of work. But I would say that increasingly in recent years, my work is focused on the first of those, on the kind of preconditions or the infrastructure of American political life, what's required for our politics to function before there is a kind of traditional left-right divide about what public policy should do. And I think those deeper problems now are the ones that occupy us, and we don't have a lot of traditional policy debates. And the reason for that is really uh, systemic failures in the infrastructure of our political culture. So that's where more and more of my time has been spent. Well, you, you already brought up, I think, three different topics that we want to touch on. So we're going to put a pin on the question of what it means to be on the right or on the left. And, and we'll, we'll, Vanessa will remind me to get there if we <laughs> digress too far. But um, you talked about institutions, which is obviously one of the big themes in your book. And also you, you talked about starting from what we do have like a conservative you know the literal idea of conserving you see like what what is the good that our society has has been charged with and how do we we make sure to to preserve it while fixing tweaking the the, the mistakes so how how does this theory apply to institutions and what do you mean by by thinking of institutions you can roll with this question because obviously this takes us to what is the problem today with our institutions? Yeah, I think it does. I mean, it's a question that gets to the heart of a lot of things. I mean, I would say for me, it's at the essence of the deepest differences between left and right in the best sense. I think left and right both have a lot to offer liberal society. And the reason is that they both begin from the mix of good and bad that every society always is. And from there, move in quite different directions. I would say the left tends to begin from a focus on what is bad, on what is broken, and want to root that out first and foremost. I think out of a sense that the good is the norm. Things should be working great. And if they're not, that's because someone is using their power to abuse somebody else. And that means that we have to start by focusing on what's broken in our society and deal with it. The right tends to begin by what's working in our society and think about not only how to preserve it, but how to build on it to address what isn't right. So that if both start from that mixed world, one starts out by appreciating the good, and often that's because we conservatives have low expectations, we're a little surprised by the good, um, and so wanna make sure we keep it, we preserve it, we conserve it. 
And I would say as a result of that, conservatives are often very focused on preserving the preconditions for social order, what's necessary for society to, to function. Um, the left tends to begin with outrage at injustice, and that's important too. And therefore, I think the left tends to focus less on order and disorder and more on oppressor and oppressed. And if you just kind of wake up a, a progressive in the middle of the night, they'll talk about oppressor and oppressed. If you wake up a conservative, they'll talk about uh, social order and social chaos. And for that reason, I think a lot of times in our politics, even when it's working well, the left and right do talk past each other. When it's not working well, and it's not working well now, um, the left and right see each other as, as massively problematic. Um, I think at this moment, the left and right each sees the other as the country's biggest problem, as the thing to be solved. And that's a, that's a mark of an unhealthy society. And so to me, beginning from these very sort of deeper, deep questions and thinking about how our political debates sort of unroll from those depths is an important way to shed a little light on them. And as a conservative, I mean, the, the, if you begin by assuming that human beings are, are broken, are fallen, are prone to get things wrong, then you really put a lot of emphasis on the institutions of formation, on those ways in which we become better than how we started out. That's what, it, that's, that's what I mean by the preconditions for social order. Those are things like the family, there are things like religion, there are things like a political order of a free society, maybe a free economy. Um, these are sets of institutions that form people to be capable of living in a free society. And I do think that conservatives tend to emphasize the importance of these because we don't take it for granted that people are suited to live in a free society. We think we have to be kind of shaped before we can be free. So to me, that's why I think a lot about institutions and why I think it's enormously important to see institutions, which we tend to see through in American life. We just take them for granted um, and don't really see what they do for us. So my most recent book, which is called A Time to Build, is really focused on what are institutions? What do they do for us? And how are they broken now in ways that leave our society broken? Because I think that without seeing things in institutional terms, it can be very hard to understand this mix of problems that we have that just seems so widespread and so profound that it's very hard to imagine what we might be able to do about them. It's so... I think the the emphasis on institutions seems to me something that exists very much on on various forms of the left as well because you yes. there is an emphasis on things are not merely a, 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 a story of individuals interacting but also an individual interacting with a system or with government which is also a form of institution and and the local institutions and then zoning in on the injustices in them. Yes. And that they need to be fixed. And because those are institutional problems, they cannot just be remedied by a person-to-person -person apology or, or remorse. Yep. This is where you're, the difference that you've pointed out between the, the, the conservative sentiment and the, 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 the liberal is that, if, if I understand you correctly, the pessimism of the conservative makes them more inclined to cling on to institutions when they work and say, don't be too quick to change things. You don't know what you're going to get on the other end. Whereas exactly. the liberal is to be to be overly simplistic, man by nature is good. The the, the corrosive uh, turpitude of our current moment is the result of some moment in history where things gone wrong, and we need to correct for that. Yeah, I would say that's right. I mean, it's not that that people on the left don't don't think about institutions, but they tend to think about institutions through the general lens that they apply to everything else, which is to say to see institutions as sources of uh, of oppression and and therefore as objects for liberation, people on the right do the same thing. We see these we see institutions through the lens we apply to everything else, and so we tend to see institutions as sources of social order, um, and that leads to different attitudes about institutions. The trouble is these views are both correct. Institutions obviously are sources of oppression, and you know both in a very general sense that they limit our freedom, they impose certain kinds of hierarchies on us also in some very particular senses, right? I mean, in American life, the term institutionalized racism is not a metaphor, right? I mean, it, it's, it's a real thing. Um, and it's a reason to be wary of institutional power. 
And yet it's also true that institutions are sources of social order, that they are the way in which people without power can, uh, can have their rights protected, can have their interests served, so that it's especially the people who don't have power who need functional institutions. And so in that sense, a lot of the debates between left and right can sort of be translated into debates about what our institutions do and what they're for. And I, I think it's important that at least some of our debates happen in those terms, because so much of what is broken down, if you think the troubles of our society now look like polarization, look like alienation, look like a, a crisis of loneliness and isolation, a lot of that is a breakdown of institutions. It's not just a breakdown of kind of individual connectedness, but of the structures of our social life that hold us together. So this is a time when we really have to struggle to see those structures and understand them in their own terms and look past the individualism that's so defined our politics now, left and right, for generations, for two or three generations at least. Right. So for people with a, with a liberal attitude, when you say we need to, we're, we're losing the, the family uh, structure, the unity of the family structure, we're losing institutions like religion and church, you are scratching sore points that are likely to provoke antagonism. Because yeah. these are institutions that in the liberal mind are deeply associated for a good reason with oppression and did not accept differences because I guess yep. that's, that's the nature of an institution. That's the, the, the restrictive aspect that, um, to put it more agreeably as you do, mold the, the character of people, right? right? But you do that by restricting, by, by drawing a line that you're not allowed to cross. So how do you make this pitch about traditional institutions to say, a, yeah. a gay person who until 10 years ago still had to go to war with friends and governments to get a marriage license. And with many of them still clearly uh, with memories yeah. of how they had to hide their nature exactly due to those institutions, the church, the family. How do you, how do you speak to somebody like that and tell them, you know, the collapse of those institutions that have historically oppressed you is actually a bad thing? Yeah, I, I, I think that, that this is a very good way to put it. You know, mold can sound like a nice word, but it's not always nice if you're the, if you're the thing being molded and if, it's not, if, it's, if you're being forced into a shape that you don't want your shape to be. So there are certainly times in American life, I would say, that we could point to where the trouble that our country faced looked like an excess of institutional strength. Um, America in the middle of the 20th century on the one hand, if you look at it as a kind of communitarian, as I do, it was a time of, of very strong social cohesion, very high confidence in institutions, a sense of national purpose. At the same time, though, it was a time of intense institutional strength in ways that felt to a lot of people in American life like pressures to conform. And if you look at the culture of that era, it is a culture screaming against pressures to conform. Left and right, by the way, it's not just the, 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 the sort of culture of the, of the James Deans in the 50s and, and the hippies. If you read the opening editorial of National Review, the first issue in 1955, which when people remember it, it's because it talked about standing athwart history, yelling stop. Most of that editorial was about resisting conformity, the power of bigness. If you take an average Martin Luther King sermon from the early 50s, before the real rise of the, of, of the civil rights movement, a lot of what he talked about was the danger of bigness, the danger of these forces of conformity. And of course, social cohesion often is exclusion, right? It, it's, it's great if you're in the mainstream. It's, it's horrible if you're not. And so from that period, we went through a long process of liberalization. Social liberalization, on the one hand, greater diversity, more choices, more options, be yourself, and economic liberalization, on the other hand, more, more consumer choices, more of a market orientation for the economy. I think both of these did a great deal of good for our society. They both also come at some price, and it's especially a price in cohesion, right? It, 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 the cost of it looks like inequality. The cost of it looks like uh, failures of uh, of. of, of a failure to identify with the larger whole, what we think of as alienation now. We're paying a price for a long process of liberalization. Inequality is a result of, of, of economic liberalization, right? Not, not necessarily and social. social. And social. The, 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 the lack of social cohesion, of a sense that we are one whole society, 
is surely in part a process of the breakdown of these forces of social conformity, which again, I think did a lot of good for us too. In the sense that people have lost the commitment to each other, like a loss of philanthropy and uh, the loss of a, a sense of social commitment and social responsibility. In part, and I think it also has led to greater political polarization. There's much less of a, of a sort of mainstream middle. W- what has happened in the course of this liberalization is that you went from f- from from a, a, an intense consolidation in the middle to two consolidated poles at the end at the ends that's what economic inequality looks like that's what political polarization looks like that's what happens when a consolidated society deconsolidates it, do, it it's not just diversity in all directions it tends to be polarization um, and again that's in ways of life the difference between people with a college degree and people without a college degree is creates basically two ways of living in America that are increasingly distinct from one another. You see the same thing happening in political opinions where there is just much more cohesive left-right differences now than there were two generations ago in America. And I think now we're entering a phase where our politics is looking for solidarity again, where rather than left and right arguing about who owns liberty, they're also each in its way trying to find forms of liberty Uh, of solidarity. I think it's important to see that this kind of tension, this kind of back and forth, is how a free society operates. There, the, the answer isn't really on one end or the other. And so I do think there needs to be a balance between a capacity for change, for, for social evolution, for changing ways of life, for adapting to different views in society and different majority preferences and protecting different minority preferences. On the one hand, And also some sort of cohesion, some way to hold society together on the other hand. These things are in tension with each other. And the way that the liberal society at its best addresses that tension is to say yes to both, to these opposing tendencies. And that means that dynamism just looks like this. It looks like we always feel like we're going too far in one direction and need to push back. And so, you know, I, I would say that The, the way to speak to someone who makes a very serious and responsible and, and valid case for allowing greater and greater social diversity is to say yes, and we also need to think about the sources of cohesion. And those sources do look like strong institutions. And these things adapt to each other. I think the case for gay marriage adapted to the need to make a conservative case and became more of a case for marriage over time. And became more persuasive as a result of that. At the same time, I, I think there has been a need for the conservative forces in American life to also adapt to the desire for greater diversity in ways of life in our society. Um, and these things have adapted to each other. That doesn't look like uh, kumbaya, but I think ultimately it's how a society evolves and improves. And so, you know, I, I don't think everything is dark about this moment in American life. I think in a great many ways, The lives we have now are better, much better than the lives of those Americans in the middle of the 20th century who were so much more confident in their institutions and, uh, and had such a greater sense of national purpose. But we also have to see the, the price we've paid and think about how we can make things better where they've become worse. That little burst of optimism there made me think that they, we need to have a word like Freudian slip, but for Steven Pinker, like you had, that was a Pinkerian slip. I, I see that Vanessa is, is bursting to ask a question. I just want before that to push back on a tiny point. The, and I, I guess that's also part of the, the deterioration of ability to communicate. But I know coming from, from the, 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 the liberal side and, 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 and having seen the process of America changing in the past 20 years, part of it I did from abroad, part of it from inside, but... There's a, a, a keen suspicion, and I think that's always the case with the, the left towards the right, that the, the call for you know, slowing down, thinking about social cohesion, don't rush to change society too fast, is just a concealed, underhanded ploy to stultify the change itself, to protect the status quo. Sure. We're fine where we are, so you just like, you'll eventually get there. Just be patient. And it's, there's this uncomfortable yeah. suspicion. And even if it's not actually sinister, It, is, it does come from a place of comfort of the people in the majority. So I, I'm wondering, I, I do want to, because I think there is a case for what you're saying, obviously, but 
it's very hard to it's a hard sell no question i, I would say there's also there's also a suspicion on the right that the left's case for social change is a case for uh, social revolution. Hmm. And that ultimately, this is really about overthrowing the family and religion. And, uh, and you know, it's all Marxism at, at, in the end. And, you know, at, at some level, at some margin, that's true too. But hmm. I think it's not true fundamentally. And the fears that the left and right have about each other both of which have been really sharpened and exacerbated in recent years um, are not entirely unfounded, but they stand in the way of a politics of accommodation, which is ultimately what a democracy needs to be. They stand in the way of saying, here's what I care about most. Here's what you care about most. Let's each get some of what we care about most. Um, we have some institutions in our politics that are designed to enable that, and those institutions now are especially broken. I, I think particularly of the Congress and the political parties, but there are others too. And, and so our politics now is not in a place where the two sides can, can trust that each has the good of the country at heart. You can't see the other party as doing what your party is doing, which is arguing for what would be good for everyone. And instead, you think the other party is arguing for what would be good for itself. And the arguments that it makes are especially hard to trust when they seem attractive, right? When they seem like maybe there's something to them, because surely there's that sinister edge. There's that sinister mm -hmm. bottom. Um, you know, I, I, I would say, I, I'd put it to you this way, and, and it's an odd thing to say, but I've spent now more than two decades I I I working in politics. I've worked for a president. I've worked for a speaker of the house. The more time I've spent doing it, the less cynical I've become about people's motives in huh. politics. I have really no question that just about nobody ever intends to do harm in politics. The, the, the issue is they disagree about how to do good. And that's a, very, that's a minority view, to put it mildly, of American politics these days. I think that if you can see that fact... And when you really think about it, it's pretty clear that people don't really wake up in the morning to hurt somebody else. Like um, rub their but, hands together. And, and, and yet very few of us really believe that about the other side. Um, I, I think seeing that is the beginning of a politics of accommodation. And I do believe that. I mean, you know, I'm a conservative. Uh, and yet I have no doubt that the left in America is well-intentioned. Um, I, I, I think that puts me in a minority. Maybe I'm wrong, but it seems to me that our politics now is not driven by that, by that premise, by that sense. Oh, I definitely want to destroy your bourgeois values, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I have a couple questions. Um, I don't know how much time we'll have to, to get into them, but one of them is a much more like just making sure that I'm like following the thread and, and understanding what happened i guess in a nutshell like there we t you talked about the mid -cent uh, mid 20th century as a time of kind of incredible confidence um and now we are at a point where you know confidence is at an all time low and so i'm trying to kind of unravel like what what were i think perhaps you were, you were talking about the preconditions like what were the preconditions that have led us to this moment um i just want kind of clarity on that and then if we have time, I'm going to ask you a, a weird question um, that comes from uh, my my urbanism background, which, which I don't know. Well, I'll throw it at you later and see if it goes anywhere. <laughs> well, so, I mean, on how we got here, I, I, I wrote a book in 2016 called The, uh, the Fractured Republic, um, which, because it was written before Trump, feels now like it was written, you know, before Christ. But um, <laughs> yeah. it, 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 that book really tries to think through that question of, how did we get from the extraordinary confidence of mid-century America to this moment? And one, of the, one key part of the answer is that our politics now often makes the mistake of starting the history at mid-century America, which actually was a very unusual time in our country. Coming out of two world wars and a depression, the level of self-confidence, of cohesion, of uh, trust in institutions was very, very unusual. America for most of its life has been more like this than like that. You know, at any point in the 19th century, if you'd looked in on America, you know, trust in Congress would have been like a joke. Uh, the idea that 
people should have confidence in, you know, in large corporations would have been preposterous. The, the America of the middle of the 20th century had unbelievable confidence in large corporations and in large things in general, uh, in the capacity of government. Um, so one part of the answer is that moment was the strange moment, more than this moment. Um, I do think that another part of the answer is that we responded to that moment by pushing, as I suggested before, for liberation and liberalization, and that gradually that tended to undermine our capacity to trust large things, big business, big labor, big government. Um, you know, by the, by the end of the 20th century, we didn't trust any of these things. And I think we've pushed too far in that direction, but that some of that pushing was necessary. We've also had, as a result of some of that, a, a real fragmentation of American life, so that there was much less of a mainstream by the end of the 20th century, a meaningful mainstream, whether that's um, in the economy, whether that's, in, by which I mean, th there was a much smaller and narrower middle class. Um, there was much less of a mainstream culture much less of a mainstream media. We still use these terms, but you know, the uh, if you look, for example, at cultural experience in the United States in 1970, the, you know, the most popular television programs were watched by like a third of households at the same time. There's nothing like that in our experience, and there hasn't been in our lifetimes. There hasn't been since you know the mid 1960s anything like that, where today a popular TV program might, might be watched by, you know, five, six million people. Um, and of course, we don't even think that way anymore. Everything is streamed and who knows. So that fragmentation means there's much less of a common experience, means there's much less of a common culture. It means people can live much more in their own kind of self-created echo chambers um, and again, it's easy to paint all this as sinister. In some ways, it's been quite harmful. It's also great. I mean, it's a wonderful thing. We've got lots more choices, lots more options. People can live the way they choose to a much greater degree than anybody could have imagined in the middle of the 20th century. We're much more accepting of minorities of all kinds um, and of, of minority views, minority choices, ethnic minorities and racial, much more. Um, Again, in ways that, that would have been just unimaginable uh, two generations ago. So I think it is important to see that American life has gotten both better and worse um, because we naturally incline to see the bad right now and to see the ways in which our politics isn't functioning. We have a lot of trouble solving problems. We can't do big things as a country. All that's true. But, you know, it, 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 that's not an argument for going back to the segregated South or to the kind of excessive self-confidence that American government had in the 1960s. So I, I would just stress that it's valuable to see the good and the bad, but that we should take the bad seriously and see what we can do about it. Yeah. I think going back to my, to my, my, strange little urbanism question here. So I think w f coming from an urbanist background, um, a lot of the ways that uh, urbanists are diagnosing kind of what's happening and the breakdown in social cohesion is uh, what they would describe as a breakdown in social infrastructure. Yeah. I find it really interesting that you use this word infrastructure to describe the relationships between us, which is kind of very, very similar to what what urbanists will describe as social infrastructure or Aaron, Eric Kleinenberg would describe as social infrastructure. And they would kind of point to a, a degradation of the role of physical spaces where we kind of share, like, let's say public parks, let's say public libraries, even just like front yards where people barbecue and have like in casual interaction as one of one of the things that has completely shifted and changed. It's hard to know what's cause and, and what's correlation and what's effect, but I'm curious to what extent you see the the way that we physically interact uh, and, and as as also part of this greater phenomenon of us becoming less socially yeah. cohesive and less part of institutions and places that would have molded us in a more communal fashion? I think that's a great question. And it, it really gets to the core of a lot of how I think about institutions. My way of thinking about it, as I understand it, is, is Aristotelian, which is to say it takes form seriously. The shapes of things really matter. And that's true both in the sense of, of kind of social structure 
and a physical structure. And, and I, I think that it, it's an insight you find in a fair amount of kind of conservative sociology of the of the 20th century. Robert Nisbet, the great sociologist, always said that Jane Addams was one of his one of his guides for thinking about uh, the, the structure of, of family and society. And a lot of the reason for that actually had to do with this question of physical space. You know, it's a it's a, a premise of communitarian sociology that people don't come together to be together. People come together to do something together. And that means that there have to be ways of drawing people into cohesion that enable them to act, that enable them to solve a problem, that enable them to uh, to address a need that enable them to somehow be acting together. When you just say to people, you need more community, you should go, <laughs> you should go to church so that you're around people. Nobody's going to do that. That that's, that's not an attractive argument, but if you say, look, we've, we've got this problem. And if we come together, we can talk about how to figure it out. And maybe we can persuade the city council to give us money to do it then people are going to show up to a city council meeting. That's the only way it'll happen. Otherwise, it's much too boring for anybody to want to do. And so I I think that sense that we have to think about the architecture of human interaction, and that means both the conceptual architecture, you know, the, the structure of the family and the community, but also the physical architecture. Is there a place to go? Is there somewhere to be where you're not alone? Um, I, I think that is enormously important, and I absolutely do think that this kind of urbanist thinking um, has a huge amount to do with the sort of arguments that I'm trying to make about how to about how to attack loneliness and uh, and, and the, the, the shortage of solidarity. It's also it sh- it has to inform how we think about virtual spaces, how we think about the architecture of social media and the internet, where there's just not enough thought given to. The, the shapes of these spaces and how they then shape our social lives. And it certainly seems to me that architecture and urbanism have a lot to teach us about how all of that should work. Last night, Vanessa said something that surprised me as we were preparing for this interview. You mentioned that libraries are one of those institutions that actually emerged strong and resilient in recent years. And I wonder if you have any yeah. thoughts about this. I, I, I love libraries, and I, I, I think that libraries are one of those, I mean, you know, w- right now, when it seems like every form of social cohesion interaction is breaking down, and I don't just mean in the, in the pandemic, although that too, um, we really have to think about where are people still congregating, right? And it goes back to this question of, to, to think about how to solve a problem, you have to ask yourself, what is working? Um, and so, what can we learn from what isn't broken? Um, I, I think that libraries are a great example of what now is working. Um, libraries haven't gone away, even as it's become easier to find things to read online, even as people have tended to isolate from each other. Um, you know, public libraries are, uh, in cities and in towns and even in rural America in some parts play hugely important roles um, as, as sort of centers of community. I think the same is true of schools, where if you ask yourself, Uh, You know, on the one hand, you can say uh, public schools are an institution in some trouble. On the other hand, public schools are an example of successful, effective localism. And there's really nothing like it in the American experience where decisions are made at the local level. There's enormous commitment to it because people care about their kids um, in every situation. And if they have the time and ability, they're going to invest in that. And, and so you have to ask yourself, how can, you, how can we build on these in ways that enable people to be more engaged, to be more involved? How do you, how do you draw on what's working to address what's not? And I absolutely think public libraries are an underappreciated uh, example of functioning American social life. There ought to be much more attention paid to them than there is. We talked a bit about schools, so maybe it's time to transition into universities, mm-hmm. which are perhaps a bit more in trouble. I know Adam has strong thoughts and opinions about uh, academia and where it's, you know, uh, failing potentially at the moment. Um, American academia specifically. American academia specifically. Adam, I don't know if you want to skip over some stuff, but it, we could talk about like journalism school a bit. No, go and, ahead. So so as, as Adam and I were talking last night about, you know, academia and where things go wrong. So Adam and I met in, in journalism school. Which you 
just cannot announce without a caustic smirk. Well, yeah, it was it was a very hard to decision whether to go or not because you don't need a journalism degree, and this is a very expensive. Um, well, you do if you want to get paid. Well, here's the question, right? This, this is going to like I think this is going to lead into a lot of what I think you've all you, you say about academia and part of where 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 mm. it's at at the moment. But um, I had this really interesting experience where I had been working as an a quote unquote online journalist, if that's not a you know contradiction in terms. And um, when I got to Columbia Journalism School, I definitely felt this uh, kind of emphasis on what is the the kind of mythical moral ideal of a journalist and what this this journalist is supposed to do and be like and act like. And at the same time, I could not wrap my head around how out of touch this institution was with what was actually happening in the world. And, and in no way was it really preparing me to deal with the ethical quandaries of what it means to do journalism and online uh, in, 20, in the 2020s. And before, I suppose, early tw- 2010s and on. And so I, I, I f- had this kind of difficulty understanding, like when I left journalism school, rather than feel like I have now been formed to be a, a ethical journalism and go forth, I had the feeling of that was a lot of money. At least I have it on my resume. Um, but I actually feel like there wasn't much... Um, it felt like a, a fun diversion from reality. And I'm curious to get your take on, I, I know that uh, you kind of emphasize that you know, when it comes to institutions, we we want to be molded for the better and we want to kind of take on those ideals and go forth with them rather than just have a thing to check off on your resume. But it, it feels kind of hard to do when the institution itself is essentially f- potentially failing you in, in, in its kind of inspirational and idealistic task. So I'm just kind of curious to get your thoughts on that. And, and I just want to add more, just a little, a tiny bit more content to this, because the type of ethical quandaries that we would be taught about in journalism school, and the mold that they wanted to fit us into, were designed to raise awareness about and help us prevent the kind of Judith Miller controversies. But you know what hardly came up? Just how fucked up the industry is on an institutional level right now. They didn't say, hey, the, the incentives are so fucked up right now that when you go out, you're going to find yourself borderline plagiarizing content with, with what people call aggregation in the notorious Huffington Post jargon, but which is not something that everyone, including the New York Times, is just doing as part of their quote unquote journalism. They didn't say, hey, the incentives are so fucked up that you're going to be constantly dialing up the, 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 the partisan anger because you're optimizing for social media outrage. All those questions, which are the, the, the ugly reality of journalism today, were elided in university. And that, to me, just heightens the absurdity of both the academia and journalism as an institution and leaves one wondering, what good are you? Well, there's a lot to say to that. I mean, I, I, I take a couple of things. I think about journalism school both as, an, a, a, as a facet of academia and of what I would describe as professionalism, both of which are, um, are, are useful ways to think about what institutions are and what they do. Um, journalism in America became an institution in the, in the course of the 20th century. Um, it wasn't always that, uh, you know, if you, if you'd looked in on American journalism at the end of the 18th century, uh, it would be very recognizable to a 21st century American. It would have looked a lot like this, very fragmented, very low, low barriers to entry, but also very few, um, gatekeepers, very little public trust. Everything is very politicized. It's very hard to distinguish conspiracy from reality but it's awfully interesting um, and engaging and fun and everybody's reading it. Um, I, in the course of, I, I would say alongside the process of industrialization and the kind of growing scale of everything in American life, journalism became professionalized. Um, it became consolidated. It came to be owned by large corporations and it came to have a kind of professional identity 
so that journalism schools began to appear by the end of the 19th century. And the idea was that journalism is, it works on something like the model of science rather than being a kind of satellite around mm -hmm. politics. Um, and journalism follows a process of verification and confirmation. And the reason you take a journalist seriously is because he or she has followed that process. And that's as good a way as we have of distinguishing what's true from what's not. Um, and, and so the process lends them credibility. And journalism school is there to teach them the process and to help them understand that they have to live by that, um, that there's a professional code here. Obviously, all of that is broken down in a thousand different ways um, in, in, the, in the past generation and more. Um, some of, you know, in part under economic pressure, the kind of fragmentation of that consolidated journalism, uh, and, and also a different economic pressure. It's just hard to make a living. It's hard to sustain a journalistic institution. It's hard to make money in any way. And so people are just trying to do whatever they can and don't really have the luxury of the traditional forms of journalism. Um, and so I think you've seen a kind of deprofessionalization under intense pressure, um, largely economic pressure, somewhat also cultural and political pressure, um, so that exactly what the journalism schools are for now, I think is a real question, a question that they probably haven't dealt with. I mean, it's not a world that I know very well, but, you know, the, 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 if the purpose is to prepare a rising generation to enter journalism, then they need to be very different than they used to be because that, th that world that people are entering now is just very different than it used to be for journalists, much more than for many other professions. I, I think it's incumbent on them to keep up with that and to provide that useful service or else they're not useful. And especially if they're not actually necessary for getting the job, right? You can't get a job working as a doctor at a hospital if you haven't been to medical school, but you can get a job working as a journalist if you haven't been to journalism school. So they have to justify themselves in some practical way. I would say this also, though, points us to the larger challenges that face the academy and I start in thinking about those challenges by just appreciating how much we expect mm -hmm. of the academy in America. Mm -hmm. um, we have very, very extravagant expectations of what universities are supposed to be. And I think that is in some ways a distinctly American thing. We expect them to be a path into middle-class life. We expect them to be a path to truth and light and beauty and all of that. Um, we expect them also to be socially transformative. And that's not new. That's not a 1960s thing. That's always been. I mean, you read the charter of Harvard and Yale, the first two universities in America, they were created to compel the larger society to re repent of its sins. That's very much what today's activists are also trying to do. Uh, and at the same time, we also expect it to, you know, keep 19-year-olds safe and happy. These are very hard things to do. And there's no way we could ever be satisfied with the university as an institution in America. And we never have been satisfied with it. So that to ask ourselves what's wrong with the university, you have to try to be really specific. Um, there's always something really wrong with the university in America. But I think what's wrong in this moment looks more like a, a, a failure to pursue these goals through the means of teaching and learning than has been the case in the past. And universities have often lost sight of their particular purpose, their distinct character, and have just become another place, another venue for standing around and yelling about politics. It's not universal. That's not happening in every, you know, in every part of the American Academy. But I think to the extent that there is a distinct problem now, it, the problem looks like that. And of course, it's also related to this challenge of, are they actually providing people with the skills needed to thrive in modern America? Which is not only a question for journalists, but for all manner of people paying all manner of money to get a, a university degree. Uh, it made me think of, of a conversation with Martin Gurry, what he just said about our over expectations from uh, academia and, and maybe the fact that it's just an overloaded institution, kind of like policing. And I, that fit, fits into your yes. your your point about uh, uh, rebelling against the bigness. The bigness created 
unrealistic expectations from the public and what an institution can actually deliver. And once it failed to do so, you see this constant sense of, of dissatisfaction and, and a desire for revolt, as, as uh, Guri puts it. No, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I, I really, I, I like a lot of Martin Guri's sort of frameworks for thinking about this, this moment. Um, I, you know, there are, there are institutions that we just demand a lot of. And oftentimes it is those that are still functional in this moment. And a lot of institutions seem dysfunctional, like, like schools, like K through 12 schooling. If you just make a list of what do we expect schools to do? And you, you then just look at that list and ask yourself, could anything really do all of this? The answer is surely no. Hmm. And, you know, especially in a time when a lot of what we expect of it are things that families should do, that community should do, that, um, you know, all manner of just a healthy society should do. We expect schools to do it because schools are still functioning. Um, I, I think the university in some ways has a different problem that we've always hmm. expected the university to do and just an amazing range of things that has meant that Americans have just always been frustrated. I mean, why was Yale created? Yale was created because the very low, small little world that was sending its sons to Harvard concluded that Harvard was terrible. Um, and it happened like within 20 years of Harvard being created. And, and you know, wh why were the, the late 19th century universities created, University of Chicago, Duke, Stanford, Johns Hopkins, because a lot of, of wealthy Americans sent their kids to Harvard and Yale and decided that these places were just garbage. Um, dissatisfaction with, with even elite higher education is just absolutely universal and pervasive. So again, I just say that because this feels like a moment when everybody's worried about the university and we can learn from that and we can think about what it means, but hmm. it's always a time when everybody is always concerned about the university. That's just, th this is where the elite sends its kids. So they're going to worry about whether that place is any good. So talking about dysfunction, uh, what do you think about politics? What's the... <laughs> <laughs> nice segue, uh, <laughs> is, This is one of the, the, I think, the ideas that, that you're... Um, most famous for at the moment and the 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 way in which political institutions have changed yeah i mean on on that front i i think politics is maybe the most prominent arena in which you can see the pattern that i try to describe in this latest book of mine time to build um by which a lot of our institutions have gone from being formative somewhat of the people in them from at least having an ethical force some idea of integrity that lets you judge how they're doing to instead being performative, being stages or platforms for people to perform on, to display themselves, to build a following, build their brand. I, I think what's happened in our national political institutions um, has to do with a kind of transformation of the political into the performative. And, you know, in some ways, the Trump era particularly elevated that and displayed that. I mean, Donald Trump himself just was a performance artist. Um, and he never really had, I think, a clear sense of what the presidency was supposed to be, other than a platform for performance. And he was never formed by our political institutions to have any such sense. He's the only president we've had who hadn't had uh, an elected office before or been in the military or served in, in, in some other high capacity in government. So he just hadn't been formed by government. He'd been formed by a career that basically involved playing the part of a successful real estate developer. And so he was playing a part, but you see this in Congress too, in a very powerful way among people who have even less of an excuse for doing it, where they tend to see the institution and the power of the institution for them as a way to elevate themselves to a more prominent place in the culture war, to speak to their selected audience in a way that makes it easier for them to be heard. And, you know, I, I think that that is tremendously destructive, particularly of the institution of Congress, which is intended to be uh, an arena for deliberation and accommodation. The institution is designed to force accommodation. And that can only happen when it can have an inner life, when there's a space in Congress that isn't a stage, but that's more like a room where people who differ come to some agreement. And Congress just has fewer and fewer spaces like that. Everything has become a performative space. And everything is done for cameras. 
And the work that only Congress can do, which is this work of accommodation and, and, and bargaining, just isn't being done. And it's not going to happen anywhere else. Courts aren't built for that. That's not their purpose. The, 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 the executive branch isn't either. And if Congress isn't going to do that, then no one's going to do it. And the, what does politics look like when no one is engaged in that kind of work of accommodation? It looks like our politics now. As somebody who's uh, like had a hand in, in both the 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 hard the, the real work of politics and from the outside as a political theorist, what's your prescription for uh, Congress to 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 try and fix itself? And do you think it's realistic in the in the near future? Yeah. I mean, I, I think you have to begin by thinking about the incentives that confront the people in Congress, right? Th these men and women are not stupid. On the contrary, they're also very ambitious. They want to succeed. And the question is, what does it mean to succeed? Right now, what it means is to be a prominent figure in, in the culture war or in the, the kind of entertainment universe around our politics. That's actually what it means to succeed so that they are succeeding. The, the Matt Gates and the, the AOCs and others who do a very good job of, of using Congress to build a following, they're not failing from their own point of view. They're failing from my point of view because I think the purpose of Congress is, as I say, to enable compromise and bargaining and accommodation. So in some way, the incentives that they confront have to point them in that direction. I think that points in a few, to a few sorts of reforms. One is a set of electoral reforms. Um, I, I think, for example that the primary system as it exists now drives things in this direction and that more open primaries that don't just attract the extremes of each party would be a little more likely to drive people toward a politics of bargaining and accommodation because they'd be trying to build bigger tents. Um, I also think that some electoral reforms like uh, ranked choice voting, uh, multi-member districts in Congress would be much more likely to advance the development of meaningful factions within our two big parties. These ideas often are understood as, um, as sort of left-wing ideas. I actually really disagree with that. I think as a practical matter, first of all, they would help the right more than the left um, because there are more of these kind of locked away voters. You know, there are a lot of Republicans in California. They, they just never win elections, but there's more Republicans in California than there are in the South. Um, and a, a system that was more representative of minorities within, uh, within regions would help the right quite a bit, even as it helped the left in places like Nebraska or, or, uh, or Georgia. Um, I, I, so I think that these are ways of enabling, uh, enabling greater diversity within our party coalitions that would create more factions that could bargain with each other. And then there's some reforms in Congress. Um, like enabling the committees to matter more. That's what most members do most of the time. And right now it's a total waste of time. Nothing that happens in, the, in, in committees ever goes anywhere. The decisions are all made by, by leadership and ultimately you vote on things you didn't write. That can change. The budget process can change. Uh, you know, we can get into the weeds on that kind of thing. But I, I think breaking down some of the rules that were created to empower leadership um, and created for good reasons, by the way, created to, for example, to disempower Southern Democratic committee chairmen in the late 1960s who were stopping civil rights bills. Um, we, have to, we have to think about those kinds of rules now and whether they work today. And I think those reforms need to point in the direction of compelling accommodation. That's why, for example, I'm not drawn to eliminating the filibuster or other kinds of, of more majoritarian reforms. I don't think empowering narrow majorities to govern is the solution. I don't think that's what Congress is for. You don't want less friction, you just want the right kind of friction. I want constructive friction, right, that actually forces action rather than friction that is just for its own sake because nobody feels any drive to, toward action. You mentioned voting reform and expanding the primaries. One of the most imperturbable hurdles that it's facing on the national level is the GOP's own self- identity currently as a minority party and the complete formation of their strategy, if you can call it that, on restricting the vote rather than trying to expand their appeal. Because in their mind, that's the only way they can retain their lock on power. So I don't see a lot of opportunity for voting reform when 
half of the country's political machine is wholeheartedly committed yes. to limiting the franchise. I absolutely agree with that. That 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 is a that is a mindset that I spend a lot of my time pushing against because I think that's right. A, a lot of a lot of Republicans approach these questions of electoral reform by thinking that democracy reform is basically just a way to make more Democrats. And so th they understand the left as being motivated by, uh, as being cynically motivated. They think of a lot of these reforms as kind of Trojan horses. And in their defense, some people on the left actually think that way too. But I think they're wrong too. You, you can look at the evidence of the 2020 election, where th because of the pandemic, among other reasons, there was a lot more mail-in voting. It was much easier to vote than it's ever been before. And the result of that was 11 million more Republican voters than the Republican Party thought there were. Uh, the, the, the idea that there were these 10, 11 million more Trump voters out there was on nobody's mind on the right. I, I guarantee you that no Republicans behaved as though they thought there were 10 million more voters for them out there. They discovered that by allowing more people to vote. And yet that's not the lesson they're walking away with from this election because they've persuaded themselves the election was stolen from Donald Trump. And they refused to look at the reality on the ground, which was that when more people vote, more people vote for Republicans, too. Of course, it's true. More people also vote for Democrats. But that just means that the point is, how do we get more people to be persuaded that Republicans have something to offer them rather than how do we mess with the electoral system so that people we don't like aren't voting? One of the counterintuitive things that you said in the past, but for me, at least initially, was counterintuitive, was that you see the political parties in their current state as too weak rather than too strong, as some other commentators might argue. And you see this weakness as the condition that allowed for the ascent of performative characters like Donald Trump or like AOC in their ranks. The parties no longer have the power to mold the candidates in their image and groom the type of politician that would seek to govern rather than just seek a soapbox to stand on. But then you suggest uh, op expanding the, 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 the primaries, which to me seems like it will further weaken the parties. Is that because you view the parties at this point as sclerotic beyond hope? Carcasses that need to be disposed of before we can actually relaunch? Well, not exactly. I, I think the parties need to, need to think anew about what their purpose is. Um, in a sense, you know, the purpose of the parties is to form and frame the political arena. In, in American life. The parties are repositories of political professionalism in a politics that is otherwise amateur. And that means that they do have a role in selecting candidates for office. But exactly how that works has been very badly deformed by a set of reforms that both parties have been party to uh, for a long time now, since the beginning of the 1970s. Um, and their purpose was in some ways, uh, transparency, in some ways, uh, campaign finance reform. In some ways, also, each party thought there was a partisan advantage for it in some of these changes. The effect of it has been that the parties really are just platforms now. Um, they are too weak, not too strong, in the sense that it, the, the, the parties don't really decide who carries their banner. Um, there's no such thing, really, as the party. They, they just uh, enable narcissists to, uh, to perform. And the question is, how do you strengthen the parties? I think part of that, and, and, and first of all, why? Right? Why do you want a strong party? You want a strong party because a party is a national organization that needs to elect people by building a broad coalition. If you're the Democratic Party and you've got to have candidates win in, in Oregon and in Nebraska and in Florida, you're going to push to the center. You're going to want an agenda that, broadly speaking, is at least not unacceptable to people who live in Oregon and in Nebraska and in Florida. If you're the Republican Party and you've got to win big in Texas, but you also have to win in upstate New York, you're going to be a, a broad tent. Right now, because the parties are weak, individual candidates run only in Texas or only in Nebraska or only in Oregon, and they don't have to run to the center at all. There's no pressure on them because they just they have a very narrow constituency that they know very well. Stronger parties that function as coalitions and try to form majorities would have a reason to push for the center. And obviously, it's the case that in order to be an actual majority, you have to push for the center. Right now, we don't have a majority party. We haven't had a majority party in America since the early 1990s. We have two minority parties. 
each of them basically wins elections by persuading the country that the other is even worse than it is. And neither really functions as though it believes that it will control the institutions in a durable way. Um, each always thinks it could win the next election when it's out of power, and so has no reason to bargain with a majority. Right? Republicans right now are saying, look, we're going to take the House back in 2022, and they probably are. Um, at, you know, tattered as the party is, they probably will take it back. And so they're just waiting. They're not, they're not engaged in governing with Joe Biden. They're sitting around thinking about what they're going to do when they win again. And that's what Democrats do in the minority. And in the absence of a real majority, both parties are thinking about how to get their base out so that they can be a big enough minority to, to, to be a little larger than the other. The failure to think about how to form majority coalitions makes our politics more polarized. And I do think that requires stronger parties. I don't think now that can be done by going back to the pre-primary days. It just, you, you can't make the case for that, that candidates should just be chosen by, by sitting elected officials. Honestly, I think it would be better, but good luck. There's just no way. And you have to be realistic about what the public will tolerate. I think an open primary allows the party as an institution to make a decision about who to endorse. In an open primary, people don't run necessarily as a Democrat or a Republican to begin with. And the party not through a primary process, but as a repository of expertise and, and professionalism, can decide that in this election, our candidate for this Senate seat in Alaska is Lisa Murkowski, right? I say that because Alaska does have open primaries, um, and that is how that happens. And Lisa Murkowski is a centrist in a state that isn't really all that centrist. Um, and th that's in part because that system produces candidates who are inclined to seek for the center. And so I think it would be better. It wouldn't be better than genuinely strong parties, but this would make them a little stronger in a way that I also think is probably realistic. Which I think takes us to the the bigger question. And and I, I keep asking about the right simply because that's where, where you belong. But I think it's true that a lot of the things that you're saying uh, definitely applies yeah. um, on the other side. But from your perspective, and this is kind of the question that you started with, what does it mean to be on the right anymore or, or to be a conservative for that matter? Yeah, well, you know, that's a challenging question now. And I, I think the right and left both go through these periods when they have to ask themselves that question. But this is a particularly difficult one because, frankly, just of the Trump era and of Donald Trump um, and of the way in which the American right came to not only accept uh, and select Trump, but really adopt and embrace him. Um, and, you know, I'm a conservative who didn't do that. Um, I didn't vote for him and I don't support him. And I didn't, I, I never thought he made sense as a, as a national leader. And I thought he was a terrible president and a terrible human being. And, and actually stay on this because I assume that a lot of people from the left who would hear you say that was so well, obviously this is your first step into your liberal awakening. But what what it is from yeah, your it's perspective? Not. I mean, I, exactly. I rejected Donald Trump because I'm a conservative. Exactly. So that exp explain that. I, I I mean, first of all, to begin with, I think Donald Trump presented himself and was in a lot of ways an enemy of American institutions, um, as a person who attacked the legitimacy of all of our core institutions from the beginning, well before the the you know January sixth and all of that, well before he was elected, he presented himself to the country by offering an argument that said, our institutions are all corrupt, the people who run them are all cynical and corrupt, and they need to be burned down. We need to drain the swamp, and that's it. Now, there's certainly corruption in our institutions. There always is, and there is today. But I, I, I think an argument from the right should be an argument for how to vitalize and revitalize these institutions, how to help them be trustworthy, how to help them be legitimate. Donald Trump never had any interest in that. He was always an outsider, even as the president of the United States, the, 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 the foremost insider in our system of politics, he always functioned as an outsider, right? Tweeting at the government much more than understanding himself as the person who runs it. And, you know, I, I think his attitude about the country in general um, was the attitude of, a, of, of an embittered and cynical outsider And I just couldn't find anything conservative about that. Um, and, you know, I, I think he, he advanced a process of embitterment on the right and estrangement from, from American life that I think is very bad for the right and very bad for the country. 
So my reasons to oppose Trump are the reasons why I am on the right. Uh, and so they're not reasons to leave the right. But, you know, there are reasons to be engaged in the internal debates that are happening now about what becomes of the right after Trump. I, I think there are just a lot of ways in which the Republican Party has become the outside party uh, in, in American life rather than the inside party. You can see this. I mean, I'll give you an example. We think of conspiracism now as having to do with the right, but there's conspiracism everywhere all the time. What kind of conspiracy does the inside party believe in? I would say the inside party believes in a conspiracy that sounds like the Russians are manipulating our elections, right? That's the kind of thing Republicans would have said in the 1970s and 80s. It's the kind of thing Democrats would say now. The outside party believes in a conspiracy that sounds like the elites who run the government and the elites who run the big corporations are conspiring together to secure their power and screw the people. That's what the left would have said in the 1970s and 80s and 90s. That, you know, that's a kind of Michael Moore conspiracy from the 90s. But that's what the right says now. Um, it would be very out of place on the left now. I think there's been this kind of switching of roles in a way that is uh, distinctly bad for the right. Uh, an anti-institutional right is not healthy in a democracy. And I think the American right has to recover its appreciation for American institutions and its commitment to them. Uh, and that's the work of the coming years. I, I also think that that can be politically advantageous work, that that kind of argument can be more appealing to the kind of coalition that Republicans should want to build. But that's an open question. And, and a lot of people who actually have to run for office clearly don't think so or have come to a different view. So there, this is a time when we'll see some very, uh, some, some very lively debates on the right about what the right means. And so it's a time to think about fundamental questions, the kind of questions that, uh, you know, are, are sometimes easy to ignore in a moment like this are impossible to ignore. What do you say to people who, who see the, the force that Trump brought to the Republican Party as confirmation of their suspicions of the right, that the, the, the majority of the American right is not driven by your Burkean yeah. d d dependence on institutions, but on a desire to see, um, you know, America reconstituted as a hyper-nationalistic, hyper-religious society that caters to the grievances and aesthetic preferences of just one side in the culture war, with all the exclusionary tactics and repression that it implies. I, I think this has been a period of, of corruption on the right, and, uh, 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 and corrupt leadership on the right, and the it, it's it's simply the case in a politics like ours especially in a two-party politics that the the large kind of coalition of the party does follow its leader so that a corrupt leader does create a corrupt coalition i don't think that means therefore that the american right is fundamentally about trump's corruption or has always been just waiting for a trump you know, 99% of the people who voted for Donald Trump voted for Mitt Romney and John McCain and George W. Bush, who I think really did have genuinely different intentions and attitudes and goals um, and, and much higher and more serious and more elevated ideas. Um, and so that coalition would vote for the next Republican, whoever that is. But that means that it's especially important to the, that that person not be in the mold of Donald Trump, but be someone who tries to channel these political energies in a positive and constructive direction. Uh, that said, it's also the case that there are elements in the rights coalition that are racist and that, that, you know, that need to be fought, especially and first and foremost by conservatives. I think there are also some elements on the left that, uh, you know, are as bad as conservatives say. That doesn't mean they are the left, but it does mean that people on the left have a distinct responsibility to try to push back against them and make sure that they don't define the agenda of the party. That, the, the, that responsibility has not been met on the right in recent years, and it needs to be. I, I, I agree with you completely on, on your criticism of the left, um, as, as, as listeners will know. But, I, but, it, but it is noteworthy that, that, that Trump won a primary and, and Biden won a primary. And it, it does tell you something about the constituencies, I think. Well, that's true. But, you know, Trump had less support in the primary than Biden did, uh, much less. Trump never had a majority of, of the Republican primary voters. He ultimately, even when he totaled everything up, which toward the end he was running on his own, his support was in the 40s. Um, there were 17 people in that primary. Yeah, do, do you I do think, think that if the primary would have been dwindled earlier, it w he, he could have lost? 
Absolutely. Could have lost. I think it's very hard to know what would have yeah. happened. My sense that at that time was that he would have lost, but that, you know, it's impossible to say. For whatever time we have left, I, I, I planted the, the, the Birkin issue because I love your, your book, The Great Debate. Uh, I, I think oh, it's, it, is, it is fantastic. I truly recommend it to anybody who's interested in political theory, because not only is it the most, what I told Vanessa last night, the most comprehensive and comprehensible survey of, of, of the discussion between um, uh, the debate, the, the, the interchange between uh, Thomas Paine and Edmund Burke, but it, it, it really does a great job to, to elucidate how it ties into our current understanding of of political theory and also informs a lot i think about your own work because like you know yeah. an, an artist only paints himself um i what rereading it one of the interesting things that uh, uh came came to focus is burke really puts a lot of emphasis when he talks about the importance of institution and he does expend a lot of verbiage about their roles in society and in, in, in the responsibility of citizens and, and politicians specifically to preserve them from the past to the future. He, he uses a lot of aesthetic language. He, yeah. he sees the good and virtue as related to his, his version of the sublime and of, of beauty. It made me think, because he ties it together, and I think to some extent you did as well, that issue of the good with the with the role of institution like you see them as a part of the same path and when i tried started to deconstruct it in my head it kind of like broke apart into like a two axes or, or or a quadrant where you have on one side the 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 discussion between thomas uh, between Payne and burke about beauty or the good versus planning in a way like the, the, the ability of reason to engineer a better society um and on the other side you have the institutionalist somebody who believes in, 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 in tradition and, and process and the revolutionary. Yeah. And I wonder if that is part of what, uh, seeing this on this axis and not necessarily as, as two poles on a spectrum, but actually as four, that is two intersecting axes, I find it easier to start locating where I stand and where people around me stand. So like Burke, I assume that you would be on the quadrant that combines on one hand, the institutionalist and the aesthetic interpretation of morality, seeing human good as tightly connected with our concept of the sublime and beauty. I'd say I'm probably also an institutionalist when it comes to that axis. But on the other one, I get more wary about giving too much political credence to our feelings of beauty and aesthetic sentiment, and am much more drawn to believe that we can strive to improve and refine our society through rationality, through some limited form of planning and engineering. Whereas Trump takes the idea of the beauty of the aesthetic, or at least appeals to it for a lot of the voters, because he, he touches some, some aesthetic force when it comes to immigration or the culture war. So on some of his moral foundation, you might say, it's funny to say moral foundation regarding Trump, but on some of, his, of this moral foundation, it seems more akin to Burke. But then in the method, He's completely revolutionary and anti-institutionalist. So I'm starting to wonder if viewing it through these two different spectrums helps to grok out the complexities and differences that get buried under the old right-left binary. That's very interesting. I, I, I think there's a lot of truth to it. And first of all, thank you. I mean, that, that book is sort of closest to my heart. It began as my doctoral dissertation and, and is, as you say, it, it's, it, it's what I've sort of found myself saying ever since. Um, and I, I think that that kind of original debate, original left-right dispute um, does help to clarify a, a fair amount of what now happens. Not everything, but, but a lot. Um, I think that there, is a, that there is an inherent connection between Burke's emphasis on the aesthetic side of politics and his preference for, for evolutionary rather than revolutionary change. Um, and I think that has to do with the limits that he places on his expectations of human reason and rationality. Um, he has more of an artist's view of what, of, of how we can access the truth. Um, and th that th an artist as opposed to a scientist, say, he doesn't think that you can get to the truest things methodically. And in a way that is sort of clean and clear and absolute, he thinks rather that you get it through the experience of life 
by taking seriously the 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 beauty of the truth and by taking seriously evolved forms that exercise some power over you that you can't entirely articulate um i think there's also a lot of coherence in the opposite view that pain expresses thomas pain has no patience for any of burke's talk about beauty he thinks it's all an excuse for despotism um and you know he, 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 the 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 idea that you should appreciate the queen of france because of how she carries herself when the poor are starving star strikes him as just absurd um and he thinks burke can't really mean that anyway that it's just a cynical cover um for kind of power worship i i i don't agree with pain but i think he makes a very powerful case and a very coherent case um it is surely possible to kind of mix these things and to have more of a um greater openness to planning and a kind of engineered approach to public policy while at the same time also regarding tradition uh taking it seriously and and appreciating it but i think there's more tension in that kind of view and that there is the the there's just a greater inherent consistency in um in in Burke's tying these things together and i look one other thing that burke taught me is not to overvalue consistency mm. right um you know some things just aren't consistent tough you need a better theory right if life doesn't make sense in theory but it works in practice the problem is with theory and <laughs> we, you know we might need a better one so I, i'm i'm certainly inclined to think that we should be willing to live with that contradiction and in some ways we all embody that kind of contradiction in how we think about politics you know i work in public policy uh and and so think about the design of medicaid a fair amount and I, you know I, i i think that's important it's not i i'm not inclined to say well all this stuff is just you know scientific planning and to hell with it um there is some balance between these things but it is worth seeing what things look like when you get to the roots and i think that does help you explain how you prioritize things what matters most to you what side you tend to fall on as long as you don't expect too much coherence political theory does have its value vanessa do you have a final question i do have a final question um we, i think a lot of what we were talking about in a uh, way of moving forward is is in your mind we need to strengthen our institutions and so i guess my my question is well how do we <laughs> strengthen them and who i mean I have a sneaky suspicion that if uh if we that if you're on the right the thing that you are going to describe as successful strengthening may look quite different to someone on the left who would say ah that is successful yeah. strengthening so I'm curious if um if you have an opinion on is there <laughs> what does it look like and is there a way to do it in such a way mm -hmm. that would appeal to both sides Right I actually have it in my own notes you want to mold the individual but mold into what yes yeah i that's a very important question it, it, you know in some ways it gets back to where we just were and i i think there is a way that that uh, that burke and pain can help us here when you spend a lot of time reading the two of them you come to realize that all of the metaphors that edmund burke uses are about space and all of the metaphors almost all that pain uses that tom pain uses are about motion mm the the question is is the purpose of politics to enable space or motion is 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 government there to let people build their lives in their own ways and make sure that the boundaries are protected that the roof doesn't fall in or is the purpose of politics to advance our society toward an ideal of justice that we are agreed on um the easy way through that problem is to say that both of these things are necessary and they are but i would tell you that i am more inclined to think that the purpose of politics not of life but of politics is to create and sustain that space and that moral improvement is best achieved in other arenas um in the family and the community in in religion for some people um through education and through our our lives together and that 
politics has a role there. I don't think politics is is morally neutral. I mean, that that's certainly not the case. But I also don't think that ultimately the way to think about what makes political life successful is that it it sends society on a journey to the right to the right destination. Um, so to me, the what what successful formation looks like is that it forms the individual toward a kind of moral outlook that recognizes the limits of human nature, that recognizes that we all need formation, that we're all imperfect, that w- that that we all begin in a place that isn't ideal, and that we all can improve, that we owe each other something, that every human being has basic dignity, basic rights, um, and that in these crucial ways, we have to treat each other as equal. It's the role of all of our institutions to form each of us toward this kind of understanding. And I think they fail when they fail to engage in that formation, when instead they enable corruption um, or, or, or tolerate corruption. And a lot of our institutions are doing that now. But I think each institution succeeds differently in, in meeting this mission. Each institution has its own distinct definition of integrity. A successful university is a different thing from, uh, f- from a functional profession, which is a different thing from... Uh, a, a genuine and successful church, which is a different thing from a functional politics. But I do think that they ultimately work together to form a human type that's capable of living and thriving in a free society, which is a very tough and hard human type to form. The greatest achievement of our civilization is that we have a society full of people like that, people who can be trusted with a huge amount of freedom. We should really appreciate how much is required to get us all to that place. Um, and to me, that means we should appreciate the need to preserve some of the institutions that can do that, but certainly also that we should appreciate the need to reform and change and build institutions so that we can do it better. And then the question is, uh, obviously, should we be entrusted with this freedom, which is for another time. Can I ask you a quick follow-up? Of course. When you, I, I love the space versus... Uh, movement thought. And it made me think, though, because when you when you say the government is when you say the government's responsibility is to create and secure that space, there are some restrictions that the government imposes in it. And 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 yes. I think for me, I don't consider myself an ideologue, but a place where I can reliably find righteous anger is where individual freedoms run against absurd restrictions imposed by government. When the state becomes moralistic, so if we talked about gay marriage, for instance, those were restrictions put by government in, in, to yeah. a certain extent. But in recent years, we've been seeing a growing and open strand of conservatives who call for such impositions. People on the right who see it as part of the role of government to impose moral restrictions. I'm thinking about the Sorbamari yeah, wing sure. of the argument. So how does that fit in? Well, I think the question there is what, what in fact does it take to sustain that space, right? To sustain a space means to preserve the boundaries around it, to hold up the roof, um, to, to, to build walls that hold, and within them, there's a lot of space to thrive. I do think that requires some idea of what, of what the moral life looks like. There's a lot of room to negotiate about what that needs to be. Mm-hmm. Um, And, you know, a lot of what our society does is try to negotiate those rules. But sustaining the space means protecting people's rights. It means preserving people's dignity. It means securing the preconditions for people to thrive. And sometimes that does mean restricting people's actions. I mean, uh, clearly, that's part of what government is for. I, right. I think anybody would say that. But in what ways, um, you know, we live in a free society, which means we decide that together. And that's an enormous responsibility that you're not born ready to engage in. So I think part of the purpose of our institutions is to, is to enable us to get to the point where we can be part of an argument about where should the boundaries be, including arguments like what is the family. That's a serious debate. And it's a legitimate debate, an important debate that every society in some ways is always engaging in um, and that ours is engaged in, I think, in a lot of ways, in a pretty impressive way. Um, for, 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 you know, for, for, during our lifetimes. 
And so I, I think there is room, absolutely, for substantive moral content in the, the structure of our political life. But we also live in a society where that content, that substance is determined democratically. Um, and that means preserving the rules around that. How do we decide who has the right, who is the authority, what's a majority? These are kinds of questions that we have to argue about before we can have the substantive policy arguments. And in that sense, sustaining the space is the precondition for freedom. A space for the franchise, essentially. Yeah, I think that's one way to think about it. The franchise, but also... Public life, right? Civic life. It's not just about voting. Though obviously, that's essential to it. Um, Expression, conversations, yeah, disagreements. Exactly. The Bill of Rights is there for that, especially the First Amendment, mm -hmm. right? I, I think that's a big part of what the freedom of religion is for, too. But certainly, it's what the freedom of speech, freedom of uh, the, the freedom of assembly. These things are there to, to to create the conditions for people to function as citizens in a very complicated society. Yuval, thank you so much. This was fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you for listening to Uncertain Things. Follow us on uncertain.substack.com and wherever you get your podcasts. We are at UncertainPod on Twitter and Instagram. Come and argue. And if you feel like supporting what we do, give us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Share us with your friends and enemies. And until next time, stay sane. Yuval Levine. I wonder when he hears this, he's going to be like, wow, okay, first time I've been introduced in a podcast. I'm like, from Hitler to Yuval Levine. <laughs> Maybe cut that a dump.